Hi. Uh, so, apologies about uh, tax being in the way of you and your coffee. Um, but hopefully, it can be somewhat exciting. Uh, so, the topic of this, I find it exciting, um, is innovation policy. Uh, is it a worthwhile investment? So, should we as states and state actors and members of Western society, or any country for that matter, bother to have innovation policy. Why do we have it in the first place? Well, we want to encourage businesses to do business, and we want to encourage businesses from other countries if they have lots of money to bring it here. Uh, but then at the same time, we want to raise revenue. And what's the way that we attract companies from other places around the world to come here? Where we say, hey, look at us. We've got low taxes, or we've got a whole host of other things that would give you a good reason to locate yourself here. Perhaps we have knowledge and we have you know, a whole workforce that's just ready and able to do the unique thing that that company is trying to do. Uh, but at the same time, we do need to raise that revenue so that we can support our infrastructure and the schools and healthcare and so on and so forth. Um, so in brief, the, the ways from a tax standpoint uh, that you can encourage innovation and industry and companies to be located in your jurisdiction are uh, threefold. Uh, you can have, there's, there's two input incentives and one output incentive. So the first input incentive is tax credits. So you say, for example, that there's a particular type of activity that you'd like to encourage companies to do. We want to have lots of medical companies located in XYZ jurisdiction. So we're going to give them a tax credit that says, if you come here, you're going to have a lower tax here, your lower effective tax rate at the end of the day, than you would if you were located in some other jurisdiction. Because we credit certain types of activities to encourage those activities. Uh, another input incentive, a, a very popular one with Ubisoft here in Montreal, is called the tax holiday. Come here, you're not going to pay taxes for 10 years. Woo! Who doesn't want that? I want that. Um, but, you know, as we'll discuss in a few minutes here, it's not necessarily the best way to go about things. Uh, and then there's one main output incentive, it's called patent boxes. Uh, and what this is, and it's recently unfortunately made its way into Canada, uh, is um, it's a, a direct incentive for once you have I, IP located in a particular jurisdiction, once you're exploiting that intellectual property, the money that you make off of that, rather than being taxed at the normal corporate rate or whatever may be the rate that's associated with exploiting IP, you're taxed at a more favorable rate, so 5 or 6% usually. And these exist all across uh, Europe, and, and uh, the U.S. has entertained the idea but hasn't quite dived in. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, now, there are other incentives too outside of the world of tax, because there is a world outside of tax, at least that's what they tell me. Um, and so there can be cultural incentives, like for example, in San Francisco, it's a really nice place to live, I hear, I haven't been, but I hear it's really nice. Uh, and that encourages a lot of people to go there, versus in Montreal, people don't like winter, then they probably aren't gonna end up here. Uh, and there are you know, other, other incentives that can be uh, attached to a particular jurisdiction if, uh, if they're really good at marketing themselves or, or a whole host of other things. Um, you can also have direct financing uh, where a government says, we will help you and we are just going to straight up give you a grant of money so that you can perform whatever activity it is you want to do. Or engage in a public-private partnership where you have the security of a government being as a partner in your endeavor in that particular jurisdiction. Because that's more of an assurance that you can be successful in what it is that you're trying to do. Um, but the problems that end up coming along with this, uh, particularly as it, as it relates with innovation and, and the mobility now of, of knowledge, is that you can move very easily all across the globe. And slowly but certainly, the, this has, uh, through what we call tax competition, there's a thing called tax competition, where each jurisdiction has their own menu of options different things. So you'll have one jurisdiction that has a patent box and they have some tax credits, but another one that has much better tax credits, so maybe it's better to start there and then locate your IP in the jurisdiction that has the patent box. Uh, and this menu of options that you have for each uh, jurisdiction is something that tax practitioners on a daily basis are dealing with to try and understand where it's best for the companies that they're advising to go. Uh, so when you have this tax competition, you have these states that are competing against each other to have the better menu of options. 
Uh, in the G20, it doesn't become so much of a big deal because of the G20 and they have the OECD, which will dictate their policy and more or less ensure that they're able to stay as the G20, as the top 20 most powerful economies in the world. But for the rest of the world, and now to a small degree, this is affecting the G20. Uh, because you have this competition that ends up being, uh, forgive the development economics buzzword term, but a race to the bottom, it really is. Um, you have all these jurisdictions that are just trying to lower their taxes and increase their incentives to come here, uh, or there, or wherever it may be. And uh, you won't get to a point where nobody taxes anything at all, but, in the most horrible of situations, that would be the case, and we wouldn't be able to raise revenue, and we wouldn't be able to support our schools, and our infrastructure, and our healthcare, and all those other things that the government does and with our tax dollars. Hopefully, um, and so it, at times innovation policy can be good if it's if it's intelligible, uh, but a lot of times it's very short sighted. So, for example, if you put a patent box in your jurisdiction, you say, okay, if you locate IP here we are going to tax it at a low rate. Great, so that's going to get some IP into your jurisdiction and you're gonna tax it at a five or six percent rate. Awesome, but does that really end up raising enough revenue and to really do much of anything? And the evidence so far has indicated that no, that's not the case. Uh, and so great, you have a bunch of companies and a bunch of IP that's located in your jurisdiction, super, and you're supporting innovation because you're supporting the intellectual property that's been created to do perhaps wonderful things for society but you're not able to raise revenue. So there's this interplay where you have this back and forth, this fighting between do we raise revenue or do we support innovation? And how do we do it in an intelligible way that doesn't drain the government of being able to support society and have the growth and all those other sort of things? Um, so as far as examples go, uh, ways that this has been done historically, um, there's a few different things. One is called a cost sharing agreement. Uh, what this is, uh, is where you have one jurisdiction where you have lots of knowledge, say the United States, say Canada, and you have people who are specialized in a particular topic area, uh, and you have them do research. You produce the research, you get it done 90% of the way, 99% of the way. But then, you transfer it to a jurisdiction where they have a lower corporate tax rate, like Ireland, 12.5%, and you locate your intellectual property there, and all of a sudden, as you're exploiting this intellectual property, even though there's not a patent box, you're only being taxed at 12.5% rate, rather than you know, 35% in the US or here in Canada, and so on and so forth. Um, another is through uh, the nuances in tax treaty. So there's, there's this web of agreements between most countries in the world that decide how do you tax someone from one jurisdiction when they're working in the other jurisdiction. This also determines how money is taxed when it goes around the world. And so if you've ever studied tax in the international scope, you may have heard of the double Dutch Irish sandwich. Uh, it's a real thing. No, you can't eat it, unfortunately. Uh, it might be delicious, I don't know. Uh, but what it is, is it's an arrangement where you use a couple companies, double Dutch, two Dutch companies, one Irish in the middle, and by moving through this network of tax treaties, you're able to reduce your tax to nil potentially, depending on how you weasel it around. I mean, to me, it's it's a beautiful puzzle. You know, it's a fun thing intellectually, but it can lead to the degradation of the state, and that's not necessarily something that you want when you're developing innovation policy. Uh, so uh, another one, there's this thing called hybrid mismatches. So you have something that is characterized as debt in one country and equity in another. And when you transfer that money from one company to another company, because it's called debt in one country and equity in another, it may be treated in such a way that in country A, it's not taxed at all because you're sending it to country B, or because you're giving it to country B. In country B, because they're using the opposite sort of characterization, they also don't tax at all because that's their domestic tax policy. So then nobody gets taxed. The companies love this, and playing through this network of treaties is again something that tax practitioners do on a daily basis, but it's not necessarily something you want to do. Uh, and then there come things like what we heard recently, a few weeks ago, uh, there was a decision uh, in the EU relating to Apple uh, and state aid. Uh, and so th there have been a lot of ways that people have tried to combat uh, the tax evasion and avoidance. They're one and the same, let's be real. Uh, and Apple received a special deal 
from Ireland that said, you're going to have a low effective rate. Uh, they received this deal via a tax ruling, which is standard practice. So you, you go to the tax story, you say, hey, tax story, will you affirm that what I'm trying to do is right? In Apple's case, though, they said, hey, will you give us a low, low rate to encourage us to be here? Because we're innovative, and we'll locate 6,000 people in your jurisdiction. So they did. And now the EU, the European Commission within the EU, has said, no, that's not OK. You can't do that. You can't give out these tax rulings that say to a specific country or to a specific company, specific, uh, giving them, conferring on them a specific benefit related to the activities that they're doing uh, that wouldn't otherwise be available to other companies within that same country or throughout the rest of the EU. Because in the EU, there's a single EU state aid law. Uh, it's anti-competition law. It's a similar antitrust or antitrust law in, in the United States. And what EU state aid law does is it tries to make sure that there's, there's a level of fairness in the competition between the different countries within the internal market of the European Union. And so we've had these cases with, with Apple now, with Fiat, with uh, Starbucks, with McDonald's. Uh, but it's not with McDonald's. It's about the state. It's about the state and their innovation policy and their, their investment policy. They're saying, we want companies to be here. So we're going to have an investment policy that says, if you come here, you can get a ruling that affirms for the next 10 years, for the next five years, for the next 15 years, in the case of Apple, uh, that you're going to get special benefits and a low tax rate. Uh, and that leads to a whole lot of tax revenue that's lost. I mean, what, what was calculated by the European Commission is that it was 13.5 billion euros. That's a lot of euro. Ireland didn't want it. Ireland doesn't want it. And they're, they're going to go against the EC because what they want is they want Apple there because they think that's better than those 13.5 billion euros. So then we have the question of what could Ireland be doing with that? Dublin isn't necessarily in the best state infrastructure-wise. I mean, it's, as these Brexit discussions are going on, people contemplated Brexit or contemplated going to Dublin, but they don't think the infrastructure is good enough. But they just don't want to go there. Thirty-point five billion euros could do a lot for Dublin to get itself in a place where it would be perhaps ideal for Brexit. And that's that's pure speculation in certain regards, but. That's 30.5 billion euros. Think of all the different, like, it's just a lot of money. Uh, so then it comes to other things where you've got uh, not just rulings that are being analyzed by uh, the European Commission on a specific company, but ones on a whole broad swath of them, as in with Belgium and the diverted profit tax and Gibraltar and its entire corporate tax system. Uh, and, these countries, again, they want to encourage investment. They want to get foreign com companies to come there because they want to say, hey, look at us. Our menu of options is better than the guy next door. But then they lose out on a bunch of revenue. With them. They can't necessarily do the things that they want to do as a state because it's a generally accepted principle that the state should collect revenue in order to organize our society. I mean, it's, it's the price we pay in order to have uh, a civilized society. It's on the front of the IRS building in, in Washington, D.C. And, and so then there, there are other things, like the OECD. The OECD, uh, as I said before, is kind of the head honcho for all things tax policy uh, for the G20 countries. And it has embarked now on a, a massive project with 15 action items, you know, very buzzword friendly, uh, to try and stop uh, base erosion and profit shift. So base erosion is erosion of the state because you don't have a tax base from which you can draw. And profit shifting is all the legal razzmatazz that goes on with the tax treaty networks and the double Dutch Irish sandwich comes from. Uh, and in particular, Action 5 relates to this mobility of knowledge and this mobility of IP that I was talking about this point. Uh, this thing called the nexus approach, where now there is a hope that through these 15 action items, and particularly with Action 5, they're going to be able to mandate that the G20 countries and a whole swath of other countries around the world will be, will connect where their IP is located, where the actual work was done that made that IP come into existence in the first place. Will this work? I don't know. But there seems to be a lot of buy-in right now. And when you label it as your base, your tax base, is disappearing because everyone is shifting their profits around. If you can get a group of people, perhaps the G20, together to, as a group, change their tax policies to go against that, well, then it will completely revolutionize the way tax policy is done around the world, and for the better, in the sense of we don't have base erosion or profit shifting anymore. But for the worse, for the companies who like this menu of options and invention from around the world. Uh, on the flip side of the OECD, because the OECD tends to be very pro-G20, there's the UN. 
And the UN has this model tax treaty for trying to determine how taxes go between developed world countries and developing countries. Because the developing world countries are really the ones who end up getting brunt of all of this. They don't necessarily have the resources to be able to negotiate intelligible tax treaties. And if they're just trying to get some investment from someone somewhere, a lot of times they will, and they have negotiated tax treaties in such a way where you end up having no tax revenue raised at all, even though you have a huge multinational located jurisdiction. Zambia, most recently, has been one of the biggest publicized jurisdictions that is, uh, as being uh, the poster child, for the unfortunate poster child, for this sort of thing. Um, and then, on the domestic level, you, you also have reports and legislation and lobbying and all sorts of other things. That, that are done in order to try and combat tax evasion. So just a few days ago, uh, the Canadian Parliament, uh, it was their, let's see here, the Senate Committee on Finance, or sorry, no, the uh, Standing Committee on Finance. Um, the Standing Committee on Finance came out with a big report saying, we have tax evasion going on in Canada, we need to combat it, here's what we're gonna do. Does this line up with the OECD back project? Probably, have I read all before I yet? No, not yet, I'm still asleep. But, these sort of reports happen all the time. They have them. They had Senator Carl Levin in the United States, uh, Senator, former senator from Michigan. He was the head of the uh, Senate's subcommittee on investigations. And in 2012 and 2013, he had all sorts of investigations with Apple. Uh, and all sorts of investigations about all the tax evasion that was going on throughout the United States and as a result of the United States. Because the United States and its global economic power prominence has been able to uh, foster a lot of the tax evasion that goes around on the world. Uh, and he wasn't a fan. Um, and then you have uh, all sorts of other policies like uh, general anti-avoidance rules, which are rules that are layered on top of the already existing system where you can do all this tax evasion that say, if you don't meet X, Y, Z criteria as you're going through whatever process it is that you want to do as a multinational corporation or a domestic corporation, if it seems to us like the purpose of this is to reduce your tax, no, you're not going to be able to do that. But how do you judge that? How do you judge that the business purpose is to avoid tax? Maybe people really just like using the Benelux. Maybe Mauritius is a really nice place to have a company. I hear it's really pretty. I haven't visited yet, but I hear it's really nice. Like the Caymans, Barbados, all these island countries that you hear about. That's what this all plays into. And they have, as jurisdictions, shown themselves, marketed themselves, as being something that attracts innovation and attracts investment because of their tax policy, because of that menu of options. Here in Canada, do we have this? Oh yeah, we've got this. Yeah, we've got this thing called SHRED. It's supposed to support uh, research, in, uh, research and development of all sorts of things, but it's become this massive part of the Income Tax Act that in many ways can really be labeled as promoting tax avoidance because you can weasel your way through the legal razzmatazz, the tax lawyers, what we do on a daily basis in order to reduce your tax for your company, which is great in certain levels, and not great in other levels, because it leads to the erosion of the state. Uh, then you've got tax holidays, like I mentioned with Ubisoft. Yeah, Ubisoft, come here. Why? Montreal's cold. Well, you don't have to pay any taxes. All right, we'll be there. So Ubisoft doesn't pay any taxes. They've got a ton of employees up in my line, and they've got another office just down the way here. But they've got a tax holiday, so how do we benefit from them being here? Well, the belief is that if you have you know, workers who are paying employment taxes and all these other sort of things, it'll balance things out. Does it? There are a lot of studies that indicate, no, it doesn't. And this OECD Best project is trying to say, as a planet, we don't believe that those sort of policies do. And you've got patent boxes, these output incentives, where you're saying your output is going to only be paid, maybe with your intellectual property, is only going to be uh, taxed at a low percentage rather than the normal percentage that it would have. And we've got those now, or at least one coming in the way, on the way here in the back. Um, and then one in Saskatchewan. So these tax evasion, tax avoidance members, uh, tax evasion, tax avoidance um, measures that are eroding the state uh, here are here and present in Canada. Uh, and that can be a big concern. Because if you're short sighted in the innovation policy and the investment policy that you set up as a country, you may not necessarily be able to see the benefits of attracting companies to your jurisdiction. Uh, it's a very delicate uh, process when you, when you 
create these uh, different policies, and you have to be incredibly, incredibly careful about how you do it. You could end up in a situation like Zambia has, where all of a sudden you have really poorly negotiated tax treaties, and you have companies that are located there extracting your minerals, and you can't really do anything about it because you decided that you weren't going to tax. Uh, so, we don't want to stymie development, but we also want to encourage innovation and we want to encourage it. So, to me, does innovation policy, is it, is, is the investment policy worth creating? Maybe. It's got to be intelligent. 